A proud supporter of this program, Riverbend Food Bank's vision is a hunger-free Iowa and Illinois. Wheelan Presley Funeral Home and Crematory has been serving Quad City families since 1889. Wheelan Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds and are proud supporters of WQPT. Hospitals preparing for a peak in coronavirus cases, plus looking for ghosts in the cities. And welcome to my home for this edition of The Cities. And have you heard a good ghost story about the Quad Cities lately? Two authors wrote a book about them, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But first, weathering the surge. Doctors in the city say we are now entering a time when the COVID-19 cases are expected to be seen as a peak right here. Both Unity Point Trinity and Genesis Health Medical say they are prepared, but this virus is taking a toll not only on the staff, but the medical centers themselves. We talked with Unity Point Trinity Health President and Chief Executive Officer Robert Erickson about what we can expect in the coming days. First off, thanks for joining us. And second off, tell me what it's like inside the hospital these days. Oh, it's a pleasure to join you uh, today. It's, uh, it's a very surreal environment in many ways. About uh, three or four weeks ago, we basically abandoned all normal day-to-day -day operations and went into what we call incident command, which is our emergency preparedness as we're preparing for a surge of patients. And so with that, it's, it's all hands on deck, focusing on how we mitigate uh, the impact of this pandemic, how we keep our staff and providers and community safe, and yet how we also take great care of the people that always come here for things like heart attacks and strokes and trauma. So there's a part of our staff that it's business as usual and they're digging right in and doing what they do best. And then the other component is just a very different environment where our whole world seems much different today than it did three weeks ago. And let's be honest, over the next two to three weeks is when we're expecting this COVID-19 peak in the Quad City area. So. How are you preparing for that? And do you think the hospital is ready? Yeah, it's a great question. So we have a little bit, if I can call it this, a gift of time where we've been able to see how the outbreak happens in other cities, countries, markets. And so we have an idea of, of how the surge or the bubble looks. I would say the surge here has already started as we see every day more and more COVID patients uh, coming in. But we do predict that in the next two to three weeks, we're gonna see the peak of that surge. So what does that mean for so us? So what does that First mean? First and foremost. Uh, yeah, um, exactly. It, what, what does that mean as far as the hospital rooms are concerned? Yeah. So we have a, an incident command that meets daily. It's 24 seven, looking at everything from logistics to clinical protocols, to medical staff coverage, to staffing, to making sure we have enough protective patient equipment, to how we handle visitors and, and restrict potential outbreak, to how we work with our nursing homes, uh, our communities, just to make sure we're absolutely prepared. So some very real examples of that. Um, we have floors and units in our hospital that are designated as the COVID units. And so with that, we treat things a little bit differently. Um, we've got protocols for when patients are coming through the ER that might be COVID positive and how we treat that. We have, um, you know, supplies are much different for keeping people safe uh, in terms of protective uh, personal equipment. There's other very real things like we have suppressed all of our elective volumes. Um, even semi kind of elective procedures so we can conserve our staff, our equipment, our medications, and all our resources to prepare for this surge. 
You talked about resources, and I know that's been a major concern. There is specific types of masks, specific types of gowns yes. that uh, the people that work inside a hospital use. How are you doing as far as supplies are concerned? And that would include the ventilators, and I, and I don't know to what extent you need, have you needed ventilators at this point? We have, so I, I'll share with you just kind of uh, briefly the numbers uh, that we've seen over the last few weeks, and they've increased every week. So we've tested um, and have seen over 220 positive uh, COVID patients in our clinics, emergency room, and hospital. About 110 of those have come through the hospital. Now, many recover, many do very well, Unfortunately, um, the way this disease process works, we see some that go into critical care and are in the ICU. And so there's a fair amount that we have on a daily basis on ventilators. So that's the beginning of the surge. We've uh, really worked collaboratively with Genesis Healthcare, community healthcare, uh, the long-term care facilities in terms of preparing and trying to quantify equipment, staff, um, other resources that when we model these things out, what the ultimate surge might look like. And at this point, we're pretty confident the healthcare systems working together within the Quad Cities and Muscatine and surrounding areas are going to be able to handle the surge, whether it's ventilators, rooms, um, providers. And that's been a very um, analytical uh, process to identify and sort of quantify what we think we're in for in terms of the modeling. You've also talked not only about equipment, but of staff and the real heroes on the front line. I'm sure you can't say enough positive things about the doctors, nurses, and the rest of the staff. They, of course, have been dealing with this for a very long time and probably in some cases really could use a break. Have you been able to call up either retired doctors and nurses or perhaps trainees in the nursing profession that are helping you out right now? Right, they, they truly are heroic, and I don't think they view themselves as heroic because they really view this as a calling to make a difference, and now is their time to really serve. And one of the most humbling things I've seen is whether it's a physician, a nurse, a respiratory therapist, an EVS worker, they're all bonding together toward the common good here um, at their own personal expense. Uh, so with that, we try to be very wary of, of the cost of that. And no one can be blinded to seeing the news of how this impacts cities like New York, Chicago close by, um, and people are scared. Uh, you know, so they, they bond together, there's a spirit of camaraderie that um, they're able to really overcome that and focus really laser-like um, on doing what they do without, um, frankly, uh, any variation, if anything, the values, the compassion has been elevated. So in terms of how we're resourcing it and, and bringing people up, um, when we're an incident in command, we have what's called a labor pool. And so all those areas that we've, for instance, postponed or canceled elective cases like outpatient surgery or some of the areas that might typically admit patients, we've had excess staff nursing staff, aides, even physicians, that we've been able this last month to do some redeployment, training, and so they can really support our core staff uh, as we go forward and get ready for the surge. So for instance, um, our clinic organization, um, most elective patient visits have been cut down considerably. And so with that, those providers, those doctors, nurse practitioners, have excess capacity that they've been coming in to work on search planning with our hospitalists, our ER doctors, um, et cetera. So when I say it's been all hands on deck, it's just been incredibly rewarding to watch everybody almost put aside what they typically do to get together and focus on this as a community and as a healthcare system. It's been wonderful. You know what? You Every hospital, every medical center, every health department has this plan for a pandemic. It's probably been sitting in a binder on an upper shelf. Dr. Katz was saying that you probably blow the dust off of it just to get it ready. Has your plan worked so far? So it's worked really well. We, and, and we don't just um, keep it in a, in a shelf. We actually do a lot of um, 
kind of piloting tests, drills. But I will be honest, no drill would prepare you for the potential impact of a pandemic like this. So as we've learned from other areas of the country, our, our physicians, for instance, have colleagues in New York, San Francisco, and, and they're learning real time on what we can implement here, um, that we get more and more prepared each and every day. So the fact we started a month ago, I feel we're in pretty good shape in terms of our preparedness. We look every day at our supply of uh, critical equipment, critical medications, and we're able to try to procure those as best we can in preparation. Um, I also think that the curve is starting to flatten a little bit compared to some of the models. So y you never know, it's so unpredictable. But I feel that our incident command and our preparedness um, has got us uh, in good shape right now. And the fact that we've done this as a community collaboratively with other health systems, with other departments, uh, with municipalities, and even within the Unity Point system, we've got hospitals in Wisconsin, in Iowa, in Illinois, and we're able to compare notes and really uh, prepare together to make sure each one of our sites is uh, well prepared because the surge could hit different areas um, at different times and with different impact. Well, the hospital has been on virtual lockdown for more than a month, and of course that affects uh, the patients that are there, their loved ones, the families that can't necessarily have access to the patient. When do you start looking at perhaps easing those restrictions? What does it take in order to ease them? Um, it's really difficult. It's, it's one of those that nobody feels good about restricting loved ones from seeing their family members when they're in crisis. But we're in a situation where our first and uh, most important responsibility is to keep them safe, to keep the patients safe, and to keep uh, staff members safe. And we've been trying unique things like um, video conferencing in with family members. Um, we do make exceptions um, for things like end of life or if a child's in the hospital. It, it's not the same, and I don't pretend it is. But we're looking at all ways of how we can kind of preserve the dignity of family relationships while we're also trying to keep people safe. When will that be um, relaxed a little bit? We're going to have to get through this initial surge. And then um, once we have access to things like more real-time testing and being able to track and look at things, then you can start maybe reactivating elective procedures, um, looking at who's coming into your campuses. Like we've done things um, as simple as we test everybody's temperature uh, when they come in. And I think you'll see that rolled out more in public areas too as we go forward because I think as we're learning, I, I don't think this is gonna go away. I think the surge will come down and we're gonna be dealing with this for quite some time. Uh, so we've gotta be smarter on how we look at these pandemics and the impact and our own behaviors whether it's in a hospital or a movie theater or the grocery store, um, to make sure that we try to maintain a really safe environment that um, prevents the spread of things we don't want spread that could harm people. I think a lot of people don't really think about the financial impact as far as the hospitals are concerned. And you said that it's gonna be a while before we get to see people uh, uh, having elective surgeries in the days ahead. But elective surgeries is a way that hospitals do make uh, an income. A little bit of revenue comes from those elective surgeries. So what's the financial impact for a place like uh, Unity Point Trinity? Yes, it's, the financial impact's uh, gonna be significant for us and for every healthcare system in this country. And I, and I say that with, um, I understand the impact on all businesses. Um, throughout our communities, whether it's restaurants or small businesses um, that have struggled or closed. So we're, we're not alone. This has affected everybody economically. But for hospitals um, and healthcare systems, most care has moved to outpatient. I mean, probably 65% of our revenue is based on outpatient procedures, much of that procedural. Um, so we have suppressed those on purpose to make sure we can care for the COVID patients. And with that, we've seen our revenue base decline um, by 50, 60%. And yet the costs um, are high because these are medically complicated patients. We've had to invest in all sorts of things, whether it's you know the, the PPE, ventilators, the medications, um, staff. The last 30 days, we've been retraining and redeploying. 
And so it's, it's pretty devastating. We haven't really thought about the financials the last month just because I think where we're at is we want to make sure we're prepared and taking great care of people. But at the end of the day, um, it's going to add up. And we've, we've got to look at things like every healthcare system is, is how do we in the short term mitigate the financial impact and sort of make sure we have the resources to truly reactivate when we get going here. And that's a delicate balance um, as we go forward. So we're looking at that now. But the financial implications are, just like for everybody else, are pretty significant. We have been talking to you about the doctors and the nurses. And one area I haven't asked much about has to do with the mental health counselors and the people that are in crisis mitigation as far as as that area, mental health, is concerned. You, you, you have to be proud of the work that they're doing and also the fact that you have to reach out to the community to make sure that people who are troubled during this period of time, that there is a safety net for them that you can offer. Right. So it's, it's a, there's, a, there's a multiple variables that are playing into mental health here. First and foremost, we are so blessed to have the Robert Young Center and their continuum of services in the community. And so with this, it can drive up need for mental health just because our world is completely changed and it's stressful and scary. Uh, and so we wanna make sure people are getting care and we're seeing some parts of our community are almost fearful of coming into hospitals and getting the care they need because they're scared about COVID. So we wanna make sure people get the care they need, whether it's mental health, heart attack, stroke, whatever it might look like. On top of that then, the mental health community has gone above and beyond, and they've even been retraining people to help with crisis intervention with our staff and our teams. I mean, it takes a toll, um, this stressful environment. So not only reaching outward to the community, but reaching inward to support all the caregivers, patients, families, uh, the doctors, nurses, you name it, that are on the front line that we know uh, we've got to keep an eye on to make sure that we keep people well, mind, body, spirit, so they can be here not only through this crisis, but in the long term. Unity Point, Trinity Health, President and Chief Executive Officer Robert Erickson joining us. The census is now delayed because of the COVID-19 epidemic, and so far about half of the people have actually filled out their census forms. The other half, obviously, has not yet. The real question to you, have you been counted? Why should I care about the 2020 census? Every 10 years, the census counts everyone living in the U.S. Count everyone living with you. Even kids! Our numbers help shape funding and services. For all these things. That's a lot of stuff. Your responses are safe and secure. No matter who you are or where you're from. We have reasons to care. Shape your future. Start here at 2020census.gov. There's no better time to get some music into our lives than right now. There are some great solo artists in the cities who have been unable to even hit the stage since so many venues have been shut down. But a few of them stepped up to the mic at the Black Box Theater in downtown Moline before all of the closures occurred. And that includes Charlotte Boyer, who performed for us Free as a Bird. I 
Charlotte Boyer, Free as a Bird, recorded at Moline's Black Box Theater. People love a good ghost story, and there's one or two to tell, actually, in the cities. Authors Mark McLaughlin and Mike McCarty released a book that's aptly named The Ghosts of the Quad Cities. Well, Mark sat down with us on Halloween Eve, as a matter of fact, to talk about the things that go bump in the night. In fact, I'm happy to tell the Quad Cities we don't have any malevolent ghosts and we did not have any records of anybody getting horribly maimed or anything by a ghost. But it's so interesting, the Quad City area, because I mean, there's, there's paranormal societies, there are people that do the tours, there are people that are very welcoming about what's going on in their houses. Quarters One has had the tour. You were talking about the Black Hawk Hotel as well, Vili Mansion. There's a number of places where there are. I don't know if the Black Hawk Hotel has a tour. No, but no, there, no. But there is. There's legends. Uh, uh, legends of Cary Grant's ghost. Yeah, so I've never heard it's that one. Coming down the hall. Well, yeah. you know, he passed away here, you know. Absolutely. In the Quad Festival Cities. Trees. And there are those who say that they've seen Cary Grant's ghost as an el el elderly, elegant gentleman moving through the halls. And he's not the only one. They've also seen an elegant lady playing the piano. And they also, there's a, some, somebody I think they call it the whistler, that if you go through the halls, you'll hear a whistle and you'll follow it, but then you never see it. It seems to always be just around the corner. So what do you make of this stuff? Or did you not try to do that? <laughs> well, you tried to I tell the stories? <laughs> yeah. I'm just con conveying, my collaborator, Michael McCarty and myself, yes. we decided to convey the facts as we saw them. And if we, there was ever a point where we did have a touch of conjecture, we always made it very clear that it was just our personal conjecture. You see it more as, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it's fun. It's interesting. I would just, I don't know if I'd say fun, because after all, for every ghost who passed away, that meant a human passed away, True. and that's never fun. No, <laughs> but we're all going to face that. The question is, do we come back as a ghost? Yeah, and then that's the thought, and it's funny. People always say, so did you track down whether or not that was caused by a murder, or, mm -hmm. by, or somebody is looking for something they lost. And exactly. it's kind of like, you know what? Don't just assume that you once saw a ghost movie and think, oh, well, it's got to have a plot of a ghost movie. Who knows what motivates people if they, well, A, who even knows if they truly exist? Yeah. But, and B, even if they, and if they do exist, who knows if what motivates them is the very things that would motivate a living person? What made you write this book? I mean, you started by talking to the amazing Kreskin, which is amazing in the first place. Well, that was actually Mike McCarty. Okay. Mike McCarty used to be part of a nightclub that wanted to have a event with the amazing Kreskin. And so he arranged for, the, for that fraternity that's in the book that they always had reports of ghosts and, and happenings. It's a what, Pi Kappa yeah. Chi, the yeah. Palmer College fraternity. Right. Yeah. They, and they always had reports over the years of different supernatural occurrences. Yeah. And I must confess, I was hesitating there because I couldn't remember the Greek letters, <laughs> even though I'm part Greek. Oh, there you so, go. There you <laughs> Terrible. And so, anyway, so, so he found out about those um, hauntings at that fraternity, 
And so he, he asked them, hey, can the amazing Kreskin, who's coming to town to be at our nightclub, can he do a live seance there? And they did the live seance, and Mike, if he was here, he would tell you, and he always does like this, the little hairs. Ah, uh, yeah. I'm channeling Mike right now. Yeah, the little hairs on the back of his neck. At one point, he was backed into a corner, and yet he thought he could feel somebody's presence practically breathing down his neck back there. And the Seriously. Little, the little hairs on the yeah. back of his neck stood out. Well, there's other, there's other famous areas in the Quads. I think of the Black Angel, which right. used to be at, I believe, Riverside Cemetery. At, yeah, it at, used to be in Riverside Cemetery. One of the uh, deer heirs, and it's now in California. It's been moved out of the area. Oh, it, well, no, it was in California. Oh, it's moved again. Yes. I'll, Is it in New Mexico? Yes, I'll t take you to page 72. <laughs> it's on page 72. Yes, I, I've had to consult this book so much I know where everything's at. Because the, the point of it was that it was being uh, rubbed off or it was, uh, 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 I want to say luring, but it was bringing people to the cemetery in an unwanted way. Yeah, so that's that why they kind of took it out. Well, you know, it's a metal statue, and, mm -hmm. and it had, over the years, it had um, oxidized. Patina. Yeah, yeah, patina. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> It sounds like a, a nice lady's it name. Does, doesn't Here's my it? Aunt Patina. Yes. <laughs> um, but it had, because of the, the patina, it had darkened over the years, and that's why. But you know how urban legends are. People are saying the wicked statue, it, the wickedness, resulted in turning darker with the years. Mm -hmm. Now that's called. No, it's, it's actually called oxidation. It, was it also something that, like, it, if, if you touched it, was bad luck, or was there was there things if along you that line? Kissed it at midnight, you die. <laughs> like, <laughs> All right, fair like, enough. Like, like, and now there's a, there's, a, yeah. there's a nice evening. There you go. Hey, honey, let's go out to the cemetery yeah. and it's, kiss that angel. It's date night on Friday. Yes. Yeah, you also went to Crybaby Bridge. Oh, which, we did. And that's a huge legend, which is just a north oh, before west I forget, of Monmouth. Before oh, I'm I forget, sorry. No, no problem. The, before, but before I forget, since we looked it up, the that Black Angel mm -hmm. is now at a retreat in the slopes of the Sierra Grande Mountains near Rotan, New Mexico. And New it's Mexico. called the, New Mexico, yeah. And it's called the Mandala Center. So maybe it's getting therapy. <laughs> yeah, well, it's moving about. Author Mark McLaughlin joining us on Halloween to talk about the book Ghosts on the Quad Cities. It's still available at Amazon and wherever books are sold. Well, thank you for joining us for this edition of The Cities. We want to remind you that WQPT has some great online programming for you and your family. You can go to our website at WQPT.org to learn more about the PBS Kids program. It includes several interactive apps and games that make learning fun. Plus, check out PBS for Parents with online resources, including a section that helps moms and dads talk to their kids about the coronavirus. It's all free and family friendly. Check it out right now at WQPT.org. On the air, on the radio, on the web, and on your mobile device. Thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. A proud supporter of this program, Riverbend Food Bank's vision is a hunger-free Iowa and Illinois. Wheeland Presley Funeral Home and Crematory has been serving Quad City families since 1889. Wheeland Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds and are proud supporters of WQPT.